We also have in our midst Srimati Vanita Mohan of the Prakal Group and an NGO that she very successfully heads. The NGO is called Sirutuli. She's also the vice chairperson of our organizing committee and she will introduce our chief guest for the evening, Srimati Raj Sri Birla. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I slept and dreamt that life was joy. I woke up and saw that life was service. I acted and behold, service was joy. This was said by Sri Rabindranath Tagore. We cannot think of a more apt quote that defines Srimati Raj Sri Birla. Her life of giving, sharing and making a big difference. And through her service, she has spread boundless joy to thousands of people. 18,000 children who may have never seen a classroom are today starting to become what they could only have dreamt of. 18 hospitals function, 18 hospitals function, rendering service to countless people from all walks of life. 3,000 villages have seen a better world. More than 7 million people have felt a visible difference, all because this one wonderful Padma Bhushan awardee chose to dedicate her life to service. As chairperson of FIKI, Aditya Birla CSR Center for Excellence, Habitat for Humanity India, she spearheads all the social initiatives of the Aditya Birla group. These initiatives and several others are just part of the global sphere of influence that she exerts. She is on the board of Asia Pacific Committee and Habitat's Global Committee and chairperson, chairperson of FIKI's first ever expat committee on CSR, member on the advisory board of the Research Society for the Care, Treatment and Training of Children in Need of Special Care, Mumbai, and the BAIF Development Research Foundation of Pune. She is on the executive committee of the Gandhi Smriti and Darshan Samiti and several more organizations. Srimati Birla has been conferred numerous recognitions for her singular contributions in the field of social service, the Economic Times Corporate Citizen of the Year, the Rajiv Gandhi Award for Eminence in the Social Field, Polio Eradication Ch Champion Award, FIKI FLO Golden Laurel Award for her iconic stature and achievements in the area of CSR. The coveted Global Golden Peacock Award for CSR was conferred upon her by Dr. Ola Ulsten, the former Prime Minister of Sweden. These are just a few among the many awards that she has received. Together with her late husband, Sri Aditya Birla, she has been placed in the Rotary International Hall of Fame in Houston for their contributions to polio eradication. While service remains her joy, she has also been a pillar of support to the growth of the Aditya Birla group of companies. As director on the board of all the major Aditya Birla group of companies, Grasim, Hindalco, Aditya Birla Nuvo, Ultratech Cement, and Idea Cellular and serves on the board of all its international companies. She, along with her son, Sri Kumar Mangalam Birla, have taken the Aditya Birla group of companies to enviable heights in the corporate world. Srimati Birla is one of those rare leaders who has made a world of difference by choosing to let her work speak for herself. If one listens quietly, millions of people, children, Self-help groups, women and the poor will tell us just how much of a difference she has made to their lives. We are pleased to have Srimati Rajshri Birla as the chief guest of today's momentous occasion of Swami Vivekananda's 150th Women's Initiative to light the lamp and initiate an endeavor for directing Indian women to guide the world at crossroads. Ladies and gentlemen, Srimati Rajshri Birla.
the memento that is given to Srimati Rajshri Birla is an idol of Madurai Meenakshi. You know why? She had her schooling in Madurai. Ladies and gentlemen, may I request you to please put your hands together for Srimati Rajshri Birla, who has flown in specially to be with us here today to inaugurate what is going to be a, one of the largest movements, women movements of the future. Incidentally, I'm told she was also born at Madurai, so she... On the dais, we have Madam Nivedita Bide, Akila Srinivasan, Srimati Vanita Mohun, Srimati uh, Dr. Prema Pandurang, Srimati Rajshri Birla, Dr. Shanta. Well, you couldn't have had a more eminent galaxy of women. Could I please call Srimati Rajshri Birla, Director? the Aditya Birla group of companies to deliver the thematic address of the day. The thematic address of the Swami Vivekananda 150th Women's Initiative Convention, Indian Woman as the Guide for the World at Crossroads. Over to Srimati Birla. Pooja Premaji Pandurang, Dr. Shanta, Dr. Padma Subramaniam, Mr. Guru Murthy, Mrs. Vanita Mohan, Mrs. Akhila Srinivasan, Mrs. Hema Gopal, Ms. Nivedita, and Mrs. Rajalakshmi, and distinguished ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed an honor to be in your midst this evening. It's wonderful to see the sea of highly talented, highly competent, highly regarded, eclectic miss of ladies of Tamil Nadu gathered here at the Swami Vivekananda's 150th Women's Convention, <coughs> 2014. I'm, delight I'm also delighted that Dr. Premaji Pandurang and Dr. Shanta, whom I know well, are have spoken in this session. I'm sure there'll be new learnings from all of them, as well as Dr. Padma Subramaniam and Mr. Guru Murthy. This event is going to be quite an intellectual treat for most of us. Guru, as I affectionately call Mr. Guru Murthy, while inviting me to this program, explained, and I quote him, this momentous event aims to generate the much needed but already introspection among Indian women from the Indian perspective that is insignificant deficit in current Indian women's discourse. It seeks to prepare the women for a lead role at the global level. The West-centric world needs a lead from Indian women, particularly on the gender harmony." Unquote. While I was mulling over this mandate, I thought of it as an audacious goal. It put me in an introspective mode of the very issue of gender harmony. In this reflective state of mind, I first looked at our own country, India. As you know, we at the Aditya Birla Group are deeply engaged in societal issues and in helping lift the underserved from the mire of poverty and helping according according them, the dignity in life which every human being seeks. I must just, I'm just going to talk very, very briefly on some women issues that are at the fore 
for two reasons. First of all, today we commemorate Swami Vivekananda's 150th Jayanti. Swami Vivekananda was one of our greatest leaders and reformers who championed education and worked assiduously to elevate the stature of women in society to encourage them to become the best in the field that they chose. He helped unleash the creative potential inherent in women through his teachings and his work, which bolstered their self-esteem. One of his foremost disciples was Sister Nivedita, whom he inspired to lead many initiatives aimed at the education and the upliftment of women. Secondly, because all of you distinguished women can definitely make a difference to what I am about to share with you. These are concerns what we cannot afford to brush under the carpet. So let me begin with the well-known fact that India continues to be a paradox. We have this distinguished gathering of women here and we have the reality of the raw deal being meted to the girl child side by side in the hinterland and in urban areas too. Some stark facts. Today, for every thousand boys, there are only 914 girls. We still in, live in an outdated world where families believe that having a son is a blessing and a daughter is not. Therefore, we have unfortunately several cases of female infanticide and abandoning newborn girl children. We must destroy this myth and foster the girl child. We must stem all such ill-founded prejudices. The current ratio is a precursor of several social ills that may occur as we go forward. I'm sure all of you understand the gravity of the situation and I hope you will all engage in changing mindsets and rooting for the girl child. So my first request to each of you present here is to mentor 10 girls. The ripple effect will be salu salutary and very good as we will witness the changing face of our country and greater gender equality. And the second point relates to all the morbid stories you see in the newspapers on women abuse. A 2012 Thomson Reuters Foundation report on the world's most dangerous countries for women ranks India as the sixth most dangerous country. These reasons, the reasons cited are female feticide, child marriages, trafficking, assault, and domestic servitude. Personally, it is deeply hurtful to me, and I'm sure all of you as well. We have to collectively look into this problem, deal with it, and annihilate it. It is not in keeping with Indian traditions and values. We owe this to our country and to ourselves. That was not so in the earlier times. Let me drive home this point. Dr. Fatima Hussain, an academic of Delhi University, wrote in the Daily Times in Pakistan of the 11th August 211 on the status of Indian women in Vedic times, and I quote, the position of women in society is the true index of its cultural and spiritual attainment. In the Rig Vedic age, women enjoyed a high position in Indian society. They had full freedom for spiritual and intellectual development. Gagi Vachaspati was one such distinguished woman of the era. Vedic literature has references which recommend the assurance of the birth of a scholarly daughter. Daughters like, uh, like sons were initiated into Vedic studies and had to lead a life devoted to learning, self-control and discipline. Many women to become Vedic scholars, orators, poets and teachers. Some remained unmarried for a long pursuit of knowledge and were called Brahmana Vadinis. Women married at the mature age were equal partners of their husbands in the performance of spiritual and temporal duties. 
They were free to attend public assemblies and were active participants in social activities." Unquote. Again, you turn back the pages of history, you will discover that our women folk have always been very enterprising. In fact, in 1877, when no British university had accorded degrees to women, two of our women, Kadam Basu and Sarla Das, gave the entrance exam to the University of Calcutta. Kadam Basu later became the first woman doctor in India under the British. Among the other enterprising women featured Pandita Ramabai, one of the first social reformers who set up Shada Sadhan, now known as Mukti, Sa Mukti Sadhan Pune, to train women to become self-reliant. Another name that comes to my mind is Sister Shubhalakshmi, a Brahmin widow who was the first lady to graduate in 1911-11 from Presidency College, Madras. She worked assiduously for gender equity and started a home for young widows. The point that I wish to drive home is that in India, the stream of women intellectuals, entrepreneurs and spiritualists like, like the river continues to flow. Let me cite some examples from the South, Karaikal Amayar, Andal and Akka Mahadevi. A close scrutiny of the history of the West brings out largely different facts. Gender conflict has been a factor in the Western civilization. I believe women in the West had to rebel and fight for even such basic rights as voting rights. After hundreds of years of democracy, women in UK got voting rights in 1926, in France and Italy in 1945, and in Switzerland, men vetoed women's voting rights in a national referendum in 1959 when Indian women, along with men, had already got voting rights in 1950. Finally, Swiss women managed to get voting rights only in 1972. The French feminist Jane Freedom theorized that the Western political culture led by its traditions, did not offer women any positive model of the female power. It therefore excluded women from the political field. When we talk about the world being at the crossroad, it becomes necessary to identify the root causes and then move on to how Indian women leaders can help them confront these challenges proactively. The three issues that ring out loud and clear are, first, the attitude, I, me, myself, and the disintegration of the family. Second, a highly materialistic approach in life. Third, no responsibility to leave behind a legacy and for the future generations as well. I would like to share my thoughts on each of these issues and list them with how the lives and the attitude of Indian women can serve as useful pointers to make the right turn wherever individuals stand at a crossroad. <clears throat> first, on the disintegration of the family. In most West, over half of the first marriages, two-thirds of the second, and three-fourths of the third break up. Over half the households are single parent-led. Almost half the childbirths are outside wedlock, with the result in some most developed parts of the world, even the basic family function of child care is virtually state-run. One would attribute this to the inexorable drift towards right-driven model, which finally led in the later half of the 20th century to uninhibited relationships and the erosion of institution of marriage and promoted live-in relations, unbred motherhood and other totally non-conventional forms difficult to recover from. As marriages are failing rapidly, the National Marriage Project of the American Institute of Values 2012 has come out with disturbing findings about how in US 60% of men and women of marriageable age 
remain unmarried. Furthermore, the rights sworn duty syndrome has blown to pieces in a few decades the traditional family system built on norms practiced over thousands of years and inherited over generations. With the extinction of the traditional family, the elders of the family, the infirm and the unemployed have been orphaned. They have been put under the care of state and at its cost. The emotional, social and economic cost is indeed staggering. I believe the paradigm of West-centric modernity, driven by exclusive individual rights that prevail over family relations and duty, now is fatiguing. In sharp contrast, 90% of our Indian women center their lives around their family and their children. What they offer is unconditional love. The mother in the family thinks far beyond herself. She reaches out to the family, selfless in her thoughts and way of life. Most of our women realize that the joy of giving is far more greater than the joy of receiving. And this sense of responsibility, this non-self-centered attitude has earned the respect of menfolk. Therefore, universal respect for women is the grammar of gender relation in India. A little aside, much to my dismay, I find in certain quarters contemporary Indian women, intellectualism, tends to carbon copy Western thoughts that have no roots in Indian philosophy and tradition. We have to make conscious efforts to ensure that our women do not lose sight of our roots. Staying rooted and yet moving forward is not a contradictory phenomena. In my experience with women in our country, with my own beloved mother-in-law, Dr. Sarla Birla, and my daughter-in-law, Nija, I find that they are guided by an inner voice, goading them to do what is right, to live by one's conscience and by values. I have also found that following this stretch is very inspirational and gives you great peace of mind. Uh, I'm sure Dr. Premaji Pandurang will take this topic way forward. And in my opinion, spirituality as an attitude and a principled way of life can positively be an offering from Indian women to every woman in the world. And this... <clears throat> And this brings me to the second point, which is to recommend a move away from a highly materialistic approach to life. This again stems from the pathway to getting out of self-centered, I, me, myself culture. As I mentioned earlier, women in India think beyond themselves. The Indian family system, which nurtures reverence for parents, elders, and compassion for the infirm and the unemployed, is founded on Indian culture and womanhood. This has resulted in a culturally defined social security system since times immemorial and in a manner of speaking stabilizes the national economy. In the US, experts opine that the present social security cost of care of elders, the infirm and the unemployed deserted by the families in USA is estimated at over six times the GDP of USA. This is a totally unsustainable situation, they say. The guidance would be to seek to reorient the basis of their life force, and India could be a good guidepost to a much better and more involved way of living, surrounded by your near and dear ones, bound together in harmony and attachment that springs out of love and care for one another. And now, on to my third point, which is the need to leave a life of legacy and take responsibility for the future generations. In the passage of life, all of us fully realize that none of us are immortal. Regardless, there is one, each one of us, so the regardless, there is on each one of us the responsibility to try and see that we leave the world a better place for future generations. And among Indian women, I find a very strong social conscience. I also find a tremendous sense of positivity. Consequently, even when you are in the midst of a storm, our women face them with equanimity 
and fortitude, for we know that this too shall pass. This is another important trait that can be picked up by the West. Finally, I would like to see more power to elbow, more women power. This is because the potential exists. Importantly, according to the National Intelligence Council of US, India is slated to become one of the three superpowers. The world would therefore look upon India. Consequently, our women leaders can play as much a greater role. They can become thought leaders. This convention is a very forward-looking step that signals the paradigm shift among Indian women. The convention's theme, Indian women as guide for the world at crossroads itself, recognizes the emerging role of Indian women at the global level. It denotes the confidence in our women and the intellectual prowess. It is un undeniably an idea whose time has come. I believe the convention will offer a vital and sharp message and unleash the leadership of women taking it to the next level and ensure its impress upon the world. Women are an invaluable resource that simply must be leveraged. The voice of Indian women needs to be heard world over, loud and clear. I would say our women are women of substance, endowed with the ability to ensure continuity amidst change, carry on tradition with modernity, values with modern ideas, and essentially have great character. I am sure you will all play a critical role as the convention marches forward to set up the Swami Vivekanand 150th Foundation. The mission of the foundation will be to fulfill the vision of this inspirational and patriotic monk, Swami Vivekanand, which is to see India rise to a global power and importantly to re-articulate the Indian concept of womanhood for the benefit of the world. I am most privileged to propose the resolution for approval to set up the Swami Vivekanand 150 Women's Foundation. It is a game-changing initiative. I wish the Foundation and all of you every success, every step of the way, with a sense of commitment, faith in yourself and perseverance, you young ladies can make your mark on the world. You know you can. Thank you. Thank you very much, Srimati Raj Sri Birla, for taking your time off to be with us here today, firstly, and secondly, for this really, really nice and warm address that sets the tone for this occasion and initiative.